Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. On today's program, we're delighted to have with us a returning guest, U.S. Representative Jamie Raskin, who is co-chair of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus and author of the compelling new book, Unthinkable. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. We're pleased to be talking with U.S. Representative Jamie Raskin, author of the gripping new book, Unthinkable. Representative Raskin writes about being in the Capitol on January 6th, 2021, when it was under assault, then becoming House Manager of the second Trump impeachment, occurring right after the death of his beloved son, Tommy. We'll be talking about Unthinkable and Representative Raskin's role on the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol insurrection. We'll also be talking about the man his son, Tommy Raskin, was named for Thomas Paine. And the bill Representative Raskin has introduced to authorize a Washington, D.C. memorial to America's forgotten founder, the freethinker Thomas Paine. Representative Raskin, thank you so much for joining us on Free Thought Matters. Well, I'm delighted to be with you guys. Thank you for having me. So, Representative Raskin, I've read your book, Unthinkable, and that's the perfect title. And your book describes this unthinkable personal loss of your brilliant 25-year-old son, Tommy, to suicide. And then a few days later, the unthinkable attack on the Capitol on January 6th and the impeachment trial you led. And I want to thank you for writing this book and for your leadership at that time. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, I wrote the book as a love letter to my son. Um, and uh, it also became a love letter to my country, too. So um, uh, it was a very intense 50-day period that I lived through uh, with my family in losing Tommy on the last day of uh, 2020. And um, then we had our graveside service on Tuesday, January the 5th, and on Wednesday, January 6th, one week after we lost Tombo, um, was, of course, the, um, the violent insurrection at the Capitol and Donald Trump's attempted coup against the government to overthrow the presidential election and Joe Biden's majority in the Electoral College. Yeah, and then it tells the story of a week later, the impeachment vote we had in the House of Representatives, and then um, Speaker Pelosi asking me to lead the um, lead the team of impeachment managers over in the Senate and it tells the story of the trial. So we were all watching that day on January 6th and we saw you, you were right there in the middle of it and we knew that you were going through multiple traumas at the time and right during that attack itself you began drawing up impeachment papers and you made this famous comment to Jake Tapper on the State of the Union that we would like to watch right now. I, you know, I'm not going to lose my son at the end of 2020 and lose my country and my republic in 2021. It's not going to happen. So in your book, Unthinkable, Annie Laurie has read the book, and I'm going to read it next. She, she was mesmerized by the book. But in the book, you write, if a person can grow through unthinkable trauma and loss, perhaps a nation may, too. 
Are you optimistic that we can keep our republic? And if you if you are, what do we need to change? Well, um, the, the trauma of January the 6th involved um, multiple collapses in our political and constitutional system. And uh, these are things that I understand even better today with the work of the January 6th Select Committee and that will become the subject of our hearings in June and the report that we render to Congress and the country uh, about the events of January 6th, the causes behind them, and then what we need to do in order to fortify our democratic institutions going forward. I'm optimistic in that I believe that the, the vast majority of Americans reject uh, violent insurrectionism against the Union and reject uh, inside political coups by presidents against the constitutional order. Um, and, uh, and yet, uh, alas, um, Donald Trump is still at large and we have, uh, you know, a major political party, which was Lincoln's party that has become Donald Trump's cult of personality. I don't need to tell your uh, viewers about the dangers of cults um, because they centralize all of the worst flaws of uh, sectarian dogma and mind control. Um, and that's basically what has become of the Republican Party. I mean, it's organized itself around Donald Trump's big lie, uh, which is that he actually won the 2020 election and the Biden presidency is some kind of imposter or fraud. Uh, that's just a very dangerous thing to be uh, disseminating in a democratic society. So you and Representative Jared Huffman are co-chairs of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, and you recently hosted an event for members of Congress about the report about Christian nationalism on January 6th uh, at the Capitol that was produced by the Freedom From Religion Foundation and the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, and we want to thank you for doing that. And after the event, Representative Jared Huffman spoke on the floor, the House floor, about the connection between white Christian nationalism and the January 6th attack. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to bring attention to a dangerous ideology threatening our democracy, white Christian nationalism. Most members of Congress don't even know what it means, but experts from the Freedom From Religion Foundation and the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty have studied it for years. And their new report shows this movement was at the heart of the January 6th insurrection. White Christian nationalism fuses Christianity with a rigid view of civic life, a view that true Americans are white, native-born, and conservative. On January 6th, it was the connective tissue that tied disparate groups together and propelled them to action. So, Representative Raskin, we wonder what your views are on, on the role that, that white Christian nationalism played in the January 6th assault, and do you think that's going to come up um, at, during the House Select Committee hearings? Well, but undoubtedly it will. Um, you know, there were um, multiple levels of sedition taking place on January 6th, and one was just a mass protest for wild action against the government uh, called by Donald Trump that turned into a mob riot, the worst in the history of uh, the capital city and the capital. Um, the middle level of uh, sedition was the violent insurrection that was composed of um, the domestic violent extremist groups, which included white Christian nationalist groups, but also uh, the Proud Boys who were told to stand back and stand by by Donald Trump and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters, both of which have been charged with seditious conspiracy, meaning conspiracy to overthrow the government, the Klan, the uh, Aryan nations, the Boogaloo Boys, the militia groups, the First Amendment Praetorian, um, and then a number of white Christian nationalist groups. And some of these groups in this uh, extremist insurrectionist center um, had been engaged in paramilitary training uh, all of them had been promoting um, conspiracy theories and uh, Donald Trump's big lie. And then they 
essentially led as a vanguard group of several thousand the violent assault on our officers, uh, the smashing of our windows, the breaking down of our doors, and then the interruption of electoral count, college uh, vote counting for the first time in American history. They interrupted the peaceful transfer of power. But the, the final level was the inner ring of the coup, where it wasn't a coup against a president by a military faction, it was a coup by the president against the vice president and against the Congress. And after exhausting every other means he could of trying to uh, overthrow the election, uh, it all came down to trying to uh, force Mike Pence to step outside of his constitutional role and to declare new extra constitutional powers in the vice president to reject electoral college votes. And they were focused on uh, Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. Um, and Pence refused to go along with it. Um, and thank God he did, because, um, well, you know, what would have happened uh, otherwise is we would have seen um, Joe Biden's uh, majority uh, in the electoral college vote total be uh, reduced from 306 to something below 270, and that would have kicked the whole contest into the House of Representatives for a so-called contingent election under the 12th Amendment, where we vote not one member, one vote, but one state, one vote. And the GOP understood that they controlled 27 state delegations, the Democrats of 22, and um, one, Pennsylvania, whose delegation split nine to nine, would have been on the sidelines. But even had Liz Cheney for Wyoming as the at-large rep there defected and voted to stick with the real vote, it still would have been 26 to 23 to one. And at that point, um, I believe Donald Trump was prepared to follow the advice of Michael Flynn and invoke the Insurrection Act and declare martial law to call in the National Guard finally at the end of the day to put down the insurrectionary chaos that he had unleashed against us over the course of the day. So it would really would have been like his Reichstag fire moment. And that's what they had prepared for us. But uh, white Christian nationalism, that report demonstrates, pervaded the ideology, the symbolism, uh, the action of the day. And there were multiple uh, the prayers that were being offered both uh, at Trump's demonstration uh, in the march to the Capitol outside and then inside there were prayers conducted, I think even by the QAnon shaman, I think he also uh, offered some. So it was definitely the default ideology of the day. So in, in your book, Unthinkable, which I'm holding up, Representative Raskin, you point out that that Trump in calling, giving the call to have this wild time in D.C., laying the groundwork, brought all of these disparate groups together for the first time, where they could, you know, march in lockstep. And I mean, the danger still is is present. It's still present that there are different ways uh, there could be another coup in 2024 if the election doesn't go the way Trump wants. So uh, uh, briefly, um, what reforms need to be made to avoid that? Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, these groups had tried to get together uh, back in August of 2017 in Charlottesville, you'll recall. Uh, they did a lot of damage. They killed Heather Heyer, um, and they brought a lot of destruction and ideological poison to Charlottesville. Um, but their numbers had increased five or sixfold by the time uh, they got to Washington on January 6, 2021. And so people understand the way that Donald Trump used these groups for his own purposes to try to overthrow the election and the constitutional order. But they also used him. And long after Donald Trump is gone, we are going to be dealing with the legacy of a mass violent fascist street movement that tasted near victory in trying to topple the government of the United States. And these people have been encouraged and emboldened and empowered um, by Donald Trump. So one of the things we need to do is to um, to exercise Congress's powers under the militia clause. You know, but Congress has the exclusive power to regulate and train and control militias. And the idea that there are just uh, groups of armed citizens 
uh, with this hostile racist ideology calling themselves militias uh, really doesn't fit within our constitutional structure. And that's one thing that we've got to look at very seriously. Um, we obviously have to get a hold of the, uh, the problem we have with gun violence, which is a threat to everybody and which continues to exact a terrible toll um, on our people. Um, but then we have to make the systemic uh, changes in law and in the Constitution to insulate ourselves against both coups and insurrections um, in the future. So there are changes that are indicated in the Electoral Count Act. We need to protect the right to vote. We need to protect the election machinery against election subversion ultimately. And as soon as possible, we need to get rid of the Electoral College, which is now not only a constant threat to democracy as it's produced five popular vote losers in our history twice in this century alone, um, but it is also a violent danger to the public because there are so many vagaries and nooks and crannies built into the electoral college system that if you've got a bad faith actor like Donald Trump out there, each of these phases of the contest uh, can be turned into um, opportunities to um, relitigate the election and try to um, keep the election going in essence. And it wasn't always like that. I mean, I was never a fan of the Electoral College, but at least it, it had uh, generally a kind of nonviolent character to it. But now uh, we're opened up to, um, you know, not just political intimidation and continuing attempts to delegitimize what the popular vote was in particular states, but actual violence um, against the constitutional system. Well, we're so glad that we have representatives like you thinking about all of this. We're speaking with U.S. Representative Jamie Raskin of Maryland, and when we come back from the break, we want to ask him about his admiration for Thomas Paine and why he's sponsoring a bill to erect a memorial to Thomas Paine, our nation's forgotten founder, a memorial in our nation's capital. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Bill, and I'm an out-of-the-closet apatheist, meaning I don't really care what you believe, and I don't really think that you should care what I believe. I was raised in South Dakota in a strict Catholic family. I was an altar boy. I served Mass a lot of Sundays twice. We ha the, the priest gave us this little card that said, in case of accident, please call a priest. I don't really like that idea anymore since I left the church about 40 years ago. Now, if you find me alongside the road after an accident, please call an ambulance and an EMT. We are speaking with U.S. Representative Jamie Raskin. He's co-chair of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, and he's author of the poignant and important new memoir, Unthinkable. Representative Raskin, you introduced a new bill this spring in Congress to memorialize Thomas Paine, America's forgotten founder. And that's a bill that we here at the Freedom From Religion Foundation fully support. Thanks for doing that. And uh, you named your son, Tommy, for Thomas 
Paine. Can you tell us more about why we need to remember Thomas Paine and what his legacy is? You know, I've always loved Tom Paine. Uh, he came over to the country just two years before the revolution in 1774, and he fell in love with the promise of America uh, and said that America would become an asylum for humanity. Uh, not an insane asylum, mind mm -hmm. you, but a, a place of refuge for people fleeing from political, religious, and economic oppression. And he said the, the cause of America would become the cause of mankind. Um, and we can, of course, extend that to say all of humanity and womankind too. Um, and, the, you know, I think when we look at what's going on in the world today and the struggle between the democracies and the autocracies, um, you know, we understand Paine's visionary qualities. Um, you know, from the standpoint of democracy, every other political system on earth uh, has the character of uh, the emperor's new clothes. It's all an attempt to, to dress up somebody's efforts to take more power or wealth or resources than uh, is their legitimate due. Uh, and democracy is the system that tries to count each person's vote and each person's voice and each person's interests and um, interests in life and flourishing equally so that um, government becomes an instrument for the common good and public interest of everyone. Just a little bit more about Paine. He wrote the Crisis Papers. He wrote Common Sense. He wrote The Rights of Man, um, The Age of Reason. And why, why do you think he's so forgotten? And why is it taking this long to get a bill into Congress to memorialize him in D.C.? Well, it's interesting because I've got about a dozen co-sponsors, and I'm hoping to get a lot more than that. But uh, Tom Paine remains controversial to this day. Um, you know, uh, when we created the Free Thought Caucus, I actually told Jared I thought we should call it the Tom Paine Caucus, and he huh. thought that it was still too controversial. You know, I mean, Tom Paine was uncompromising in his uh, passionate belief in democracy um, and the idea that uh, the earth belongs to the living and to everyone who's alive. I think today he would probably say the earth also belongs to future generations unborn and we can't ruin everything for everybody else with climate change. But um, he's controversial because, uh, you know, everybody in America loved him when he wrote common sense, which really became the playbook for the Declaration of Independence and for the revolution. But um, the Age of Reason was an attack on uh, organized religion and the fusion of church and state. And, you know, he had some tough things to say, as did a lot of the founders, uh, including, you know, Jefferson and Madison uh, and Ben Franklin, uh, about the role that religion had played, organized religion established uh, in churches with the government. And so it's uh, a very strong argument that people's own beliefs about uh, metaphysical questions, theological questions, philosophical questions have to be between the person uh, and their own conscience, their own studies, their own values, their own beliefs, their own gods, if they believe in, in God or gods. Um, and the government can't interpose itself between people um, and those beliefs. So that obviously argues for very strong freedom of religious exercise, no establishment of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of thought. Um, and this was the Enlightenment project, and nobody spoke more forcefully for it than Tom Paine, who understood profoundly the connection between democracy and each citizen's voice and ideas being able uh, to be free and equal, and the idea of religious freedom, where the state is not coercing people to participate in particular displays of religiosity or involvement in particular sects. So Thomas Paine was a very early progressive thinker. He was an early abolitionist. He was in favor of women's rights. 
Do you think the the bill will will pass? Do you think we'll Do you think we'll have a statue to Thomas Paine in the nation's capital? Well, we, you know, we don't have one down here on the Mall, um, and we need to have one. I mean, there's statues of everybody. We had statues of uh, of insurrectionists from the 19th century, people who joined the Confederacy, people who were office holders in the Confederacy. We have statues of them up still if they had served in office. Um, in the Union beforehand, which is very much in tension with Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which says that anybody who swears an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and then betrays that oath by participating in rebellion or insurrection against the Union, shall not be allowed to hold office again. And yet still, uh, they enjoy this kind of symbolic primacy and um, cherished place in the Capitol and on the Mall. But without getting into that fight, I would at least say, you know, if we've got space for, uh, you know, people who are high ranking office holders in the Confederacy, which wage war on the Union, like John Breckinridge from Kentucky, who was uh, a senator and vice president of the United States right before the Civil War under Buchanan, um, certainly, we got a place for Tom Paine, um, whose political and moral philosophy did more than anything else or anybody else to create the intellectual and moral conditions for revolution uh, against the crown and against parliament. Well, thank you so much for sponsoring this legislation. And I just want to quote um, from your wonderful book, Unthinkable. You say in the conclusion, if we cannot get the past right, we will get the future all wrong. And we so much appreciate your getting the past right in that book and joining us today and everything you've done uh, for democracy and, um, and freedom, Representative Raskin. Thank you. Well, thanks for reading my book and thanks for having me today. And keep up the great work. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.